And um, so his principal areas of practice include performing regional and traffic impact analysis associated with public and private development, impact of fee studies and multimodal planning and analysis. He has transition planning and the traffic engineering experience on hundreds of projects involving traffic transition engineering services and studies, planning services, corridor studies, and the concurrency uh, programs. While his focus is on serving clients, his true passion is working with and mentoring professionals. So I think that's why today his topic is a career in consulting. And we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for accepting inviting oh, invitation cool. and being with us. Thank yeah. you so much. Well, thank you so very much, you and Jody. Thank you so very much for the for the invite. So, uh, I really appreciate again the opportunity to be here. I know there's um, one person live online, and I know there will be some folks who uh, will be recording or this watching this on a recording. Um, I do. Before I get started, I just kind of also want to let you know the way I usually do these type of things. It's it's nice sometimes if you're hearing your presentation, but it's obviously always better if you're here and you get kind of your questions answered. And, and my talk is going to be talk about really a career in consulting, but I've been in the consulting engineering realm now for 33 plus years. And I would love literally to make this a Q&A kind of thing about what you guys have questions about. You know, what are the lessons you've learned? What you, would you have done just coming out of you know college? What you've done in your younger years that you wish you had known back then? What are the two or three things to look for in a firm when I'm interviewing? Those kind of things. So please think of any questions you have because I'm going to make this kind of a short presentation and I'd really like to open it up. And what I usually do is when I get a question, I usually have two or three kind of stories to go with it that basically help with the presentation. So with that, uh, again, my name is Christopher Hatton. Um, I am a, um, born and raised actually three generations in Tampa. Um, Love Tampa, and uh, I uh, work at Kinley Horn. I'm very fortunate, uh, uh, and it's part of one of my stories that I'll have later, but uh, very blessed I've had one interview in my entire career. I was up at Georgia Tech, and uh, they came up to have an interview during a career fair, and that was the one interview I had. They made me an offer, and here I am 33 years later. And I know that is not normal, <laughs> very not normal, and very blessed, but there is something behind that, and I'll probably get to that uh, during a couple stories. Um, uh, as you said, I am actually very focused on mentoring uh, young uh, engineers. It's always been a passion of mine. Uh, I was mentored very early in my career, and I, and I love that aspect of it. As Jody and I were talking about that connection, which is so very important, and it's tough after COVID to get folks to have that personal relationship back in the office, back in the classroom, et cetera, but it is so very critical. Um, I did go to Georgia Tech, got my uh, degrees there, but I was fortunate uh, to be able to get the opportunity to actually get my uh, opportunity with Kimley Horn back in Tampa. Um, I see when people introduce their stuff, usually at our church all the time, they have a picture of their family and everything. I always love that. So I get the chance to do that. So I'm going to do that. Um, like I said, I'm uh, um, a, a dad and I have five kids. That's uh, my family right there. That's my lovely wife. Uh, I do have five kids. These two are twins. They're actually civil engineers transportation engineers that just started actually in February uh, in Kinley Horn, Orlando. So I guess the apple didn't fall far from that tree. Um, and then this is some of the fun stuff that just happened last year with me. I was very fortunate. Um, I was selected as the 2023 uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan of the year. I've been going to Buccaneers fan uh, games ever since I was 10 years old with my dad back in 1976. And um, I was surprised, but uh, Chris Godwin gave me these and I got two, two tickets to the Super Bowl and my wife and I got to go out there. There were 31 other fans of the year. They were, they were all great from all the teams. It was really a great celebration. So um, that's kind of a, a neat little fun fact about me. Um, and, and one thing again I'll, I'll mention because I think this is one of those kind of things that I would like to impart uh, on you in this terms is the, um, the professional organizations. Um, I'm a member of the ITE. I know Jody and many other folks, that's really kind of our, our industry uh, group that has really just been tremendous. Um, but also back in the day, um, there was a group called the Tampa Bay Applications Group. And it started, I started 
literally my first year I started attending that, and that was a conglomeration of, of uh, public agencies, FDOT, and private consultants. We would always meet at the FDOT. Uh, it was really a great, they had quarterly meetings. Casey Kersey was actually kind of the lead. She did an amazing job, worked with Danny Lamb at the FDOT. And it was just wonderful because you, they would always have somebody that came in that was talking about a topic. And they did it very kind of regimented where they had a, a regional topic, they would have a, a local topic, and then usually they would have a presentation on that. And so whatever the pr presentation topic was, we got to see a rotation very similar to kind of what this is, but it was something I really got involved in. And then ironically, they, they switched over from a kind of president, vice president, secretary to a role where they just had an advisory board. And as luck would have it, and I kind of say that, is that at, in 1976, or excuse me, 1999, when I was, I had been there for several years, I was actually the president. We, we stopped having it as being the president. We made it just an advisory board. Okay, well that never happens, right? Um, so we'll see how that works. Um, but what happened was that I then had to get up like this in front of the group each time. And since we didn't have a rotation of who was the next president gonna do that, I ended up doing that from 1999 to 2006. So literally for seven years, I was getting up there and I got to know a lot of the folks who were coming to interview and then a lot of the folks who were Thank you very much. Um, um, just people in the industry. And it was just because I was involved in something and I made it my passion to uh, make sure that the types of presentations, the people and everybody there were very uh, involved. So that's one of those things that sometimes, you know, when you say you'd rather be lucky than good, you know, I had to be there and continue to be there. And when the time it switched over and by the time it got to uh, be in that advisory group, I was kind of at that place where it just put me out in the front and it was just by uh, uh, God's good graces. So um, here's some of the things that I just kind of want to um, just hit on very kind of high level. Uh, and then honestly, like I said, I kind of want to turn it over to you for, for a couple of questions. And then I think we can kind of hit some, some, hit some other topics. Um, like I said, I've been with Kinley Horn for, for 33 years. And I think it's important, especially in, in the consulting world, you have to kind of find something that identifies yourself, what sets you apart. And I think this is not just the firm that you're with, but this is what identifies you specifically for your clients. And I kind of use that as like identifying your brand. I think it's important. And one of those things that, that I learned early on from some of my mentors was responsiveness. And so there were things that I did to be responsive. And that was like, and again, we're, we're going back to the days when I started there, there were no emails, those type of things, you know, you would actually leave messages and those kind of things. And I'll never forget, you know, people would call, leave a message and you'd get the message and you would what? Well, you'd call them back. Well, back in the days, again, there's a whole lot more emails than there are messages back in the day, but you would get several. And my, basically my brand was to always make sure that I responded back within that day. And as my career went and emails came into play, I always made sure that I responded back in an email by that day. And you can get several emails into the hundreds each day. And you've got to make sure that you are doing the right thing. You don't let emails drive your day. But also, if your brand is to be responsive and don't let a, an email, an important email, go out without being responded, you need to make sure that's something that you could, bless you, you need to make sure that's something that you can deliver on. I'll never forget there was an example for the city of Zephyr Hills and the uh, public works director, uh, Shane LeBlanc had, had left a message about a wastewater opportunity, which is not me, but he called me. And so I ended up trying to get our wastewater person, got him Wayne White on the phone. We called back later that afternoon and Shane was like, I, I'll never forget, we called and we had him on speakerphone. He's like, oh, Christopher, great to hear. I knew you'd call back before the end of the day. And I just remembered that is like, yes, he left me a message. He knew that he would be called back. So I think that's one of those important things, whatever your brand is. Now, again, you can't just adopt a brand that's not you because you won't follow through. So it's got to figure out what that is. It could be somebody that's incredibly technical. You could be the technical guru, the go-to. And if that's what you do, hey, 
they, people will know who you are. They're like, oh, I got to get this person because this is a technical problem that we need to get solved. So whatever your brand is, try to identify that and make it your own and be able to deliver and follow through. Um, and talking about some of the uh, branding, one of the things that I think is so very important is the, is the technical skills. Having a technical foundation is something that everybody needs. If you don't have that technical foundation, by the time you get to the top, it's kind of like, you know, you want to build a strong, firm foundation and build it up like this. So as you go, and as you go further and further in your career, you're going to get further and further away from the technical analysis. It's probably been a lot of years since I actually ran Synchro and those kind of things, <laughs> but I can still look at it, interpret it, that type of thing. But if you don't know back in the day how to run it and all those type of things, if you build that foundation, you're going to have a strong, firm you know, group. Now, if you do it the other way where you really just kind of, you were the one in the, you know, the group that, well, oh, they did the synchro and stuff like that, but I'll, I'll do the technical writing. I'm really good at writing or I communicate really great. And you start going up and your career is expanding. You're getting pulled into projects. You're getting this, but all of a sudden you're like this and it's going to topple when somebody asks you a technical question about what's in that report or when you're given a presentation or something like that. And you don't want to do that. So I can't emphasize enough that technical skills are critical. And for Kimley Horn, one of the things we do is we, our, our focus is, is building a practice. It's not getting into like management. So some firms, and again, this is just the way things are, you know, your, your desire to get up there, oh, I want to be the regional manager, or I want to be a manager of something. That's not the way Kimley Horn does it. It's just because me, just personally as, a, as an engineer, I like numbers. I like those type of things. So the great part about what we call in Kimley Horn is a practice builder. You get to have your practice. You get to know your technical. You get to work with clients. But again, you never leave that technical aspect. So you're going you're to have to answer questions in settings like this or technical IT meetings and, and the like. So those are important things you have to do. Um, and again, kind of building on this, you really need to find your passion and what that is. And one of the things that you know, I learned early on, and again, I was very fortunate to be at Kimley Horn where there is a focus on serving clients. And it was one of those things that really just was, was something that I just loved interacting with clients. I loved the opportunity to hear what their problems were and then be able to go and help solve them. So that was really one of my focuses early on was to how I could take my, my technical skills and focus and the like, and then be able to, you know, and then be able to uh, get that translated into serving clients. And so I had my technical aspect. I then also had my responsiveness and I built my brand, had the technical and my passion was serving clients. So I put all that and that began my practice. Um, I talked a little bit a bit about industry involvement and I think this cannot be, you know, uh, uh, underestimated from the standpoint of like finding an ITE, uh, ULI, um, uh, you know, whatever that is, be able to make sure that you commit to being in the industry so that you will connect with other peers. And then all of a sudden, again, you can get to be known. You can find out what's happening through the other folks in the industry. And I think that type of aspect is something that, again, is you will have to find out what works for you. We're not going to say, all right, you have to be in IT. If some people's like that, I don't really like that. I'd rather be in the I live in downtown. I'm going to be part of the downtown Tampa partnership because this is where I live. I want to be involved in that. That's perfect. Again, it kind of goes back to your passion and it also goes back to your brand. There can't be something that you're going to fake it through. You're going to be doing this for your career type of thing. And you've got to show that passion because again, your passion is going to be driven by your purpose and you've got to be able to find that. Um, relationships, 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 relationships. It's kind of like, you know, when you're finding a house or selling a house and it's location, 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 right? Well, relationships, relationships, relationships are what it's about in this industry and just about any other industry. But I think it's really important to, to understand the, the vast amount of relationships you get to make and kind of the in-depthness that you get to make. And that's the great thing. I heard somebody once say, you know, you make your, your friends, your clients and your clients, your friends. And it was really neat how so many of the clients that I've worked with over the years are now just my friends. One of my really good clients for over 25 years 
He's a huge, you know, Buck fan with there. And we, we talk whenever we talk after the, for the week or the, the weekend and stuff. What do we start with? We start talking about the Bucks first. And then we talk about whatever. Sometimes we just talk about the Bucks, And we talk about that. That's fine. We talk about our families. We talk about things that really connect us in our relationships. And I think that's really important. And then he's like, oh, yeah, I, I've got this uh, study I'm working on that I really need help. And this just happened just the other day where we were talking uh, about, again, he was following up about the, the fan of the year and, and like nine tenths of the way in, he goes, oh, yes, I've got this project up in Huntsville, Alabama. I'm sure you've got an office there. Can you send me the contact and whatever? And so, you know, we've got this project that's going to be up there. He didn't we didn't need to start off talking about that. He was talking. He, he knew he was going to get to it. But we have that relationship. And I think it's really important to be able to have that connection. And again, there's, I mean, you can go to a job or you can make it a career that is flush with relationships, with friends and those type of things. And the amount of fulfillment and joy that you get out of it is going to be measured by that. So I, I, I strongly encourage um, being able to focus and develop those relationships. And then the last thing I'll, I'll say really is, is obviously I think priorities is really, really important. Um, and, and that's in just in life in general. And to be honest with you, for, for me, it's my, it's my faith, my family, and then my career. And I think it's important because you hear a lot of things about like work-life balance, um, burnout, um, just things that, you know, drive you in terms of your, of your life. And I think it's so very important to make sure that you know your priorities and then you stick to them. Because I've seen people's, not just in this industry, but, but others, you know, become a, a, a slave to their job and they don't focus on other things. So it's really important to do that. And I've been fortunate in my 33 years, but I will tell you, I'm certainly far, far from perfect. And I've had issues in those other areas. And so you have to refocus and those type of things. So it's not easy. And I tell you, no matter what, and I've got five, again, wonderful kids um, that are incredible in what they do. Um, and so I try to be the best role model, but I will tell you, I have made mistakes in my life and my career that I try to be a role model where I can tell them what I did and what I did wrong and, and how best to, you know, maybe not do it this way, those kind of things. So I think it's important to really focus and understand that part because it's going to be something that everybody's going to have to give your own priorities. And if you don't set your own priorities, something will set them for you. And you do not want that from that standpoint. So with that as kind of a long-winded introduction, uh, I just kind of want to open it up for any type of kind of questions about consulting, careers, any anything that you might have. Yes. So it's been three years, and when we talk about technical skills, Okay, 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 it's good, it's good. So it has been 33 years, and for the second bullet about the technical skills, mm -hmm. are there anything that you have done before, but you are not using the technical skill at all now? Because civil engineering, of course, compared to many other engineering, computer science or others, I think our you know ground breaks are not so much, and our progress is a little bit different. So. Um, in terms of technical skills, do you see the obsoletes of some of them? And well, I, I there are there are certain things that, like again, I don't use right now, but I think it's important that the the industry still uses them. You know, I do transportation studies. That's my the basis for what I do, and things like the, the transportation demand modeling. You know, that has changed from the FSU TMS to the Cube now to VSIM, so it's changing and. I don't get the in, in, ins and the outs in terms of how to actually run the model, but I certainly know how it runs. And when it was just going up, actually just last year when they were making the change, you know, I went to one of the meetings, but they, the DOT was smart and they had kind of, I think they call it like executive, whatever, like meeting for a half day. And then they had a full day for the people who were learning the training. 
So there's things that I think that are important to always know and understand. You know, had I not gone there, I wouldn't have known what the nuances were for and why they were changing and those type of things. Um, and, and you still got to always be connected on that aspect. You don't want to just ever all of a sudden get a report and go, oh, that's great. And, and read over it and not know why the things are going in there, those type of things. And then there are just things, you know, like just GIS and all the type of things that are coming in. Just this, the technology that's come over the last 10, 20 years, you know, you, you'll be able to utilize. But again, certain folks will be utilizing that at different points in their career. So you want to be able to utilize it, know what it is. You don't necessarily need to know exactly all the ins and outs from when, you, when you're at this point. But again, by the same token, and you're all time and where you are in your career, that's what you do want to learn. And you want to be able to learn it and not just learn it, you know, on the surface. You all want you want to be able to understand, ask the question. That's why it's so very important when they do have training opportunities for HCM, the um, synchro, those type of things to be able to go to those and be able to make sure you're you're getting an understanding, whether it's your peers and your partners that it can help. But you do want to know that and you always really, again, want to make sure you know it before going on to the next level and the next level. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. Here. I think it's close. Yeah. I, I'll just repeat the question. So <laughs> for our microphone, yeah. Oh. Nice work. There okay. Uh, so I know that consulting companies and academias both do studies, right? Studies on certain topics. So I, my question is that how their studies different? So when a consulting company is doing a study, what's make it different from when an academia person or a group are doing a study? Well, I, I know our, the studies that we do for the FDOT, for the counties, the jurisdiction, local type from a transportation study. I think often, so there's a set format, there's set requirements, bless you. There's certain criteria that you have to do. So, you know, in, in, in my line, and I, I got my master's at Georgia Tech, and it was um, taking uh, an old program you guys have never heard of, I'm sure, Transit 7F, but it was a, it was a program and we used when GIS was just coming on. So we were using GIS to actually pick the different um, intersections that automatically dumped them into Transit 7F, which is kind of a it, was a, it was an arterial model, then to run that. So, you know, for a traffic study that I'm doing for FDOT to determine whether or not uh, turn lanes are needed, and then again, how the length of the turn lanes, that's a specific format and it's, you know, details now it varies based upon the you know the 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 roadway what's the access class for the roadway what's the design speed and all those so there are variables that go into that i guess the way i see more of the academia a lot of times it's you know you're trying to maybe create something new you're you're trying to figure out like is our things the designs like our cuts are our cuts like better than full meeting openings or directional meeting openings or such and such so you've got almost you've got like a, a a problem you're trying to solve here, and you probably have this much money when you're doing a FDOT traffic study to see if you need turn lanes. You've got this much money, and that's kind of the difference. So the the depth that you need to go into the research usually in academia to talk about um, safety enhancements. So we would probably look at for doing a, in a traffic study, we would look at the let's say the next adjacent intersection for the project. And we do a, you know, we look at signal four, try to look at the data. Is there a crash issue, you know, safety issue? For more of an academia, you would not only look at that, but then you'd have to, then you'd look into what are the de specific details and such like that. And it's just, I think it's a level of depth. And so for some projects in consulting, you do need that depth. But for the great majority in academia, you're doing, you have, you have research funding that's, that's the primary focus. The primary focus for consulting with the transportation studies is not whether or not you need a left turn lane or not. It's, you know, let's get this 
piece of land through the process, get all the permits, make sure that we make it safe, make sure that we have operational uh, issues addressed and all that kind of thing. So it's usually looking kind of with two different goals in mind. One usually is getting it through the process, getting it through permitting, getting it built. This one is looking for safety, you know, the best safety blank out there, you know, whether or not it's a, a new design, a new, um, you know, basis for coming up with a new ultimate uh, um, access or something like that. So I think that's really what it is in terms of the level and depth of check. So, so when you refer to the legal person, so judges are the master here. Mm -hmm. So do you encounter the problem that they might be different uh, than your consulting company? No, they so, might have different views. So if they, if that different view make it a problem at the start. Well, I, I don't, I don't think it's, I mean, again, I got my master's, so, and, 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 you know, my, my focus was that, and the reason I even, I got my master's because I was, I was terrified to go out into the real world. I, I, I figured I didn't know anything, even though I had studied in the book, I wasn't really ready. Um, so I got my master's because I did want to know more. I wanted to know and, and get that foundation of like before that a little bit more detail. Um, so when I came out, you know, I was ready, but again, I then was very open to whatever I was doing. So I was doing, you know, I did my thesis on this, which, you know, took this much time and all of that, but, you know, I turned it around quickly and, and made it realize that I'm doing, you know, five, $10,000, you know, traffic studies. Now I've also been involved in pd es or overpasses and large scale projects, but my portion's always been like this. And so, you know, it's kind of one of those kind of ideas that, that are out there. You know, early on, I was doing whatever it takes. So, no, there's not a problem with that. I mean, we want the smartest people out there, but we also make sure that you got to be able to adapt and be able to know that, hey, this, this is what we want. So if you can get me this to what you want, and, hey, if you're super fast and efficient and for a $10,000 budget, you can do it for $8,000, whew, you probably are even better on our team than anybody. So there's not a there's not a bias if that's what you're asking that kind of thing. It's a lot of times it's just their folks is like like I really enjoy doing this. I enjoy doing the research. I love and and so if you do the flip side of that and all of a sudden you know you look well how was the traffic study and they spent 49 hours on one thing when it probably should have taken you know 20 hours. And you're like yes, but I did all this and I did all the research and I got it like. We didn't need that, you know, because we have to follow this guideline. They give us these, that kind of thing. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's a little bit right, just. I think, um, I think comparably, because I come from academia, you come yes. from consulting. I think comparably in academia, when you do a study and work like somebody, you can think beyond the box. Yes. But what yep. consulting, yep. you have to deliver certain products yep. that as is. expected. So I think that's right. a huge difference. Yeah. And that, that is true. I mean, we are we are given certain criteria, guidelines that we have to follow. There are variables that change. So, but you know, the good news is that we often go into. They say, "Hey, I want to get a blank there. I want to get a full meeting opening there. I want to do something like that." So then, that's where our creativity comes in. You're like, "Well, how about let's try an R cut?" The client goes, "What's an R cut?" You know, and you're like, "Okay, great. Let's look into that and those type of things. How will it work and everything?" And those are that's where you kind of get your uh, ingenuity kind of that comes out of the, yeah, comes out of the box. And I think also consulting company actually could vary from one to the other. Sure. Some companies, thank you. Some companies they may more research oriented, or they have a, a department is very research oriented and depend on who their clients are, right? So yes. they were the yep. high PhD students. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, many companies in aviation field. They do that. So really dependent on who um, the clients are and what they are looking for. So Chris, we do have a question from online audience. Okay. It said, thanks for the information, pre informative presentation. Could you please share some valuable experience on how you balance your research and a personal life? Uh, I guess you already prioritize that, right? Your yeah. personal life, your family well, is higher than your career. Yeah. Well, no, that's that's a that's a great question. I was kind of one I was hoping. I have kind of written down like I'm going to get to that. Uh, so a great question. I think the 
the focus there is that, again, you have to prioritize it. So, you know, you look back and saw my family there. Um, I had, you know, again, still have a twin daughters that started playing uh, flag football in the sixth grade. So they were, they just, they were just two little cute girls that were out there, just wanted to do things. I grew up obviously with the Bucks, the football, they started playing flag football. And one of my passions was to watch them. And so, uh, and we have the wonderful flexibility as grown adults at, at Kinley Horn to be able to, hey, get your work done, but also be able to have that flexibility to work with your families. So from literally the time that they were in sixth grade through high school, um, which is like seven, eight years, for every single flag football game that they played, I was there. I never missed one. Now I did that by calendaring that. And some people go, oh really? You calendar that, those kind of things? Your family would have said, I say, absolutely. That's just how I do it. I mean, some people will, good luck, but I'm, I'm an analyst who likes to write things down and then check them off, you know? But for me, it was important because the calendar is important. You have clients that come up, but it's also, I'll, I'll have something on there that says, you know, flag football game. And they were amazing. I'll just give them a little plug. They went to UCF and actually played on the flag football team out in Texas and they won the national championship in 2022. So beat the University of Florida um, in 2022, which was amazing. And that was that was a January 7th or 8th or so, something like that. So my wife and I went for two straight years to go out to Texas. We flew out there, put that on our calendar. We made sure we were going to go out there and watch them and, and do those things. So um, I think it's really important. And there's there's things that you have to prioritize. Again, I'm not perfect. And again, you have to have a wonderful team that you can work with because your client says, I need you this on this hearing. You're like, uh oh, there's a there's a conflict. And you hope that you have a partner and stuff like that that can you know fill in for you, that type of thing. But I think calendaring it, making sure that it's the high priority in my my outlook, it's it's the red one. So it's the one that gets the priority. Yes, yes. And I think the culture of the Camille Home of providing flexibility maybe that's right. one bigger reason of keeping you there for so long right yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, we do have another question from our audience did you ever consider opportunities private or public for change of experience or does your participation participation in professional organizations provide a comparable variety hmm. um that's that's a that's a very good question i th i think i understand the first part i guess I will, I will say that, again, very fortunate and, and maybe a plug for Kinley Horn, I will say is that it is provided and our core purpose is to in, provide an environment for us to flourish. Mm -hmm. So it's really out there to build your own career. So you can come in and literally make what you want in your own career. So it, it was always changing. And there are people, I mean, this is a true story. There was a, a person out in, in Colorado, he did, he did gondola design. Now, you're not going to do that in Florida or probably a lot of other places, but I mean, it, it, it worked out there. And he came to join us in Kimley Horn out in our Denver office because he got to then serve the clients that he was serving, but they got to basically work on all these different projects. So he got to get so many more projects because he was just doing the ones that were, you know, in the Colorado area. So he, by joining Kimley Horn, got to be all, all you know, all these different areas. And so again, Kimley Horn, we, what we call is a corral, as long as the the client or the project that you're going after is within what we call again this corral, and that means it has to be within like moral, ethical, uh, profitable, um, and being able to be in this corral. As long as it's in there, go for it, and you'll get partners along the way to do things. So you can create what you want. And a lot of times, early on in my career, it was like you know people would say, "Hey, great," you know, and it's like you know you meaning me or my partners would like, "Well, you're Kimley Horn," and I could have I could have asked them, you know. How big or small do you think Kimley Horn is? And they're like, I don't know. You're Kimley Horn to me, and that type of thing. So it was very, very opportunistic to where you got to the chance to build your own career. Uh, again, as long as it was in that corral. And so that's why, yeah, I really, honestly, never, um, I'll say, never seriously uh, considered going to another place. I did because my dad always told me I got invited more than a few times to go out on a dinner or lunch to talk about other opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it was never, you know, never better. 
And so I really always enjoyed it from that standpoint. But the other part, I, I will say from that standpoint, bringing up the other industry and stuff like that, you know, going and getting involved much as Jody has within ITE, just to see all that's happening, like I said, in, in Florida or nationwide, if you get involved in all that, being able to see those type of things, whether it's just the different firms or the agencies, the public agencies, or something you know as amazing as Cutter, those type of things, just to be that exposure to. Because some people, if you weren't like, I know Georgia Tech had a research institute, obviously Cutter has one of the best ones. If you're in a place that has no idea what that is, and you don't get exposure to it, that might be your passion. You might want to have that ability to research, but if you've never done it because you've just been staying at home or in, you know that type of thing. So it is very important to be able to do that just for the exposure because while Kimlin Horn is great for a lot of folks, as we say, it's not for everybody. And there are people that would flourish in Kimlin Horn that would, and there are other people that would flourish at the DOT, the agencies, the cutters. So you just really want to find the area that you can flourish and be happy with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I do have another question. Um, yeah. So you mentioned about the relationships. Of course, no matter where you're working, industry, private, public sector, whatever, academia, industry, setting up the relationship, build up the relationship and maintaining it is very important. But I, I guess you have lots of advantages. You are so local. You were born here. You were like working here all the time. So it's probably easier to build up and also maintain those relationships. But for many of our students, especially graduate students, they are international students. Mm -hmm. And many of them may stay here after, you know, getting a degree and start right. working for industry company or public sectors. So um, I guess they are kind of at more disadvantage uh, stage compared to uh, you or many others. So I was wondering, have you observed, because you involved in mentoring the young and early career professionals. So have you observed some successful uh, colleagues like who were international students before, but they have done something that they actually did a great of building up and maintaining those relationships. Is that something that you can share with our students so that they can learn? Yeah, no, that's that's great. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it a little bit just because I, I think it could be for everybody. And one of the lessons that I learned because um, I've you know answered these kind of questions before is it's funny. I, I, I went to school here in, in and around actually spent a year at USF. <laughs> but I was my local high school here. I went to Jesuit and I had all these connections, but I honestly didn't use them. I'm, I was really, I think I've kind of grown out of my introvertness, but I was really an introvert when I started and I did not use those kind of connections. So I had to learn what you're asking. So as great as it was that I was in the Tampa Bay area and we had a couple generations of family and stuff like that, people knew, but when it was the transportation, Christopher Hatton engineer, nothing so i had to build it from there and, and really the person that hired me and that was really one of my mentors gave me and, I, and i'll read these because i think these are really important and again it goes down to again relationships how do you build a relationship most often 90 percent of the time it's it's one-on-one -on -one, right and you can do this at an industry function you could do this at a, a dinner meeting afterwards you could do it at the ite socials that they have and the like and it's really important that's how you build those relationships. And it applies to, to everyone. And my mentor who gave these to me, so I'll just make sure, because I think it's really important. And what we say, especially what I still do, like to this very day, when I'm mentoring some of the young professionals at Kinley Horn, I say, you got to ask somebody to lunch or do a coffee walk and you got to talk to them and you got to do it at least once a month. I mean, we've got about a hundred people in our Tampa office. I'm like, you got plenty of people to do. I mean, just put them on your calendar and that kind of thing. But the questions are that I think it's important is, is asking them really kind of really what they do. And that's different because it's not just like their role, but it's really what do you do? As we were talking about, you know, our kids wondering what we did. You can have a role of Christopher Hatton's a principal, blah, blah, blah. But no, what do I do? What is my everyday like? Because you want to see if that's something, A, that maybe you want to do. But also, it's a way to kind of get in to understand what they do and have that kind of relationship building. Um, the second, and I think this is really important, is like, how did you get here? And I think that's really important. That's kind of like their career path. 
And I think that is so very important because you can find things that, that overlap or you could just find things that are like, wow, that's really kind of amazing, this kind of thing. And I think that's, you, you can never quite kind of, you know, underestimate like somebody's career and how they got there because it just, again, might be something that will help you in your career. And I'll never forget, you know, again, going, you know, when I had my interview at, uh, at in Georgia Tech with Kimley Horn, they were up after a career fair. And so I got, you know, the interview, I was still going through my master's and I still had another nine months to go and they made me an offer. So I said, you know, this is great. So I told my dad, I said, dad, who got my offer? And he's like, don't take it. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And he's like, no, you can't take your first offer, right? And I'm like, uh, no, I'd really like to take this offer. <laughs> And I would literally like to not focus on anything but my master's and whatever. And so there was a little bit of a you know back and forth. And I'm like, okay, you know, and I've always listened to my dad, you know. And so he said, well, you know, see what you can kind of get out of it. And I'll never forget, true story, I was reading in an ASCE magazine and they had won this award, Kimley Horn had for a leadership program. So he's like, ask him to be in that. I'm like, <laughs> like counter offer? I'm like, you know, I'm this tall, you know. And so I did. So I said, okay, you can't hurt by asking. And so I asked Chris Squires, he's like, sure, you can do that. So I accepted. And it was funny too, because I always told my dad, I said, dad, if I, if I do this and I don't like it, you have all these other people you think are gonna offer me jobs, they'll still be there, right? So I will take this and it's obviously worked out 33 years later. So it's one of those things is my career path all of a sudden started with one interview that could have gone either way but then the whole focus was that, and this is something that I also want to make sure, because I've told this to some folks, told this to some of my best friends, kids who are now going into school, whether it's engineering or not. I have a really good friend who's actually just, he's actually in his first year over here at USF, and he was actually going to get ready to go into engineering. He's like, well, you know, engineering maybe, his dad's an attorney, super smart guy, but he's like, you know, we'll see how it goes. And I'm like, no, you won't see how it goes. I said, you put it in 110% effort, and if you like it, great, you never know. But if you don't like it, we'll, we'll pivot. But if you just see how it goes, you will never know whether or not it was you just not giving it 100% and the like. So there's things like that, that was, would be ultimately, that's gonna be TJ's you know, career path. We'll see how it goes, but those type of things that I think are super important, always putting it in there. And on a one funny little side note, you know, I was, then many years later, I did for about 10 years, I actually did interviewing at Clemson University because I was at Georgia Tech. The person who was did, getting his PhD and literally helped me through my master's, I would never have gotten through my master's if it wasn't for him. I don't know if this is recording still, but um, so he did not get um, tenureship and didn't get tenure at Georgia Tech. So he went to Clemson and he's amazing. He's my one of my best friends and if not my best friend, and is amazing in Clemson. His name is Dr. Wayne Sarasua. He's just incredible. And it's it's really just um, amazing how he was like, hey, come to Clemson so you can do some interviews for Kimley Horn. And it was wonderful because I do sessions like this. We do information sessions. We talk the, the, the night and then we do the interviews the next day. And I'll never forget, you know, people asking about like, you know, you know, you're talking about Kimley Horn and you're you know, 10 years into that, you're talking about like retiring from Kimley Horn. Really? I mean, you know, the, the average person has like six or seven jobs in their career. And I came back with, well, you know, don't be the average person, you know? The average person might have six or seven jobs in a career, but I'm fortunate and I'll tell you, it does happen. You can have one interview, you can have one job that leads to a career, but you have to go all in. You have to be ready to commit yourself. And it's, it's kind of like when you go through interviews, and this is just another kind of little tidbit, when you're going into an interview, I mean, you gotta go all in. An interview ultimately with a firm that you could be at for 33 plus years is like, what does that mimic in life? A marriage, something like that. <laughs> so you don't wanna go in and just kind of go, oh yeah, I've got this interview on Friday. You know, Have you prepared? Not really, I know, whatever, and stuff like that. And trust me, that's seen by the folks that are interviewing you. And I tell you, my number one thing when I'm interviewing is, for instance, if they don't show up with a pad and paper and a list of questions that's probably at least two pages long, 
that's that doesn't impress me. I mean, you got to have remember this could be the place that you are going to retire from if you put in all the effort to do that. But if you're just going in, it's kind of like going on a first date and going, oh yeah, want to get married? Yeah, okay, that never happens. But that's kind of what you're doing if you're not preparing totally for for an interview. So just just a little side note there. Um, and then of course the the third part when you're asking folks again building the relationships is I think is really important. What is that advice? Again, Jody and I were talking early on about some of those lessons learned. You don't want to have to be the only one to make all the mistakes and then learn from them in your life. If you do, it's going to be a very, very hard life. And I tell you, the one thing that I found, especially at Kinley Horn, and that's ultimately the reason was that leadership training. That's the reason I committed to go there. That has changed my life. And it was mainly because all these people had been there and they were committed to training and to telling me the lessons they had learned, the advice and everything like that. So it was that ability to have that forum, those people that I could learn from, find out how I could improve in terms of what I was doing and have a, a great career. So, so I think that's from a standpoint of relationships. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So uh, my question is about um, uh, you just mentioned the GIS pops up at 15 or 20 years ago and people need to the engineers to learn about it and it's becoming more and more popular. So uh, for your forecast for the next 10 or 20 years, uh, do you think there will be any new technology come out in the field of the transportation? And yeah, like the civil engineering is a very traditional discipline comparing with the AI, something new this year. Yeah. So uh, what could we do to keep ourselves embracing the new techn technology? Yes, or right. to help us to make a, I want to use the word touchdown to gain sure. the <laughs> six points in an effective yeah. way. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. that's that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I will say this, and just thinking about like being, you know, civil engineering is, is, is wide, but specifically we'll talk, you know, maybe transportation, because again, that's, that's, that's my area. Um, I think the most important thing that will be coming out, and this goes back to academia and actually research and the like, and is, is safety. You know, everything that has been literally the last five or 10 years with a focus on what, vision zero. And I don't think there's anything more important and no matter what we do, then possibly saving somebody's life. So I, th I think the focus there would be to try to find whether it's, you know, technology with with traffic signals, um, retrofitting, you know, signing and marking things that we can find that will help improve the safety on our roadways, at our intersections, those type of things are that's it's it's head and shoulders above anything else. So what whatever that technology is, and you can be involved in being part of the research. I, I would, if I was in school still, I would have done everything I could to, to find and be a part of safety. And I, and I will tell you, uh, one of my other first mentors when I was at school at, uh, at Georgia Tech, he was an amazing professor. He was, he was an icon. They called him Dr. P, it was Pete Parsonson. And he was just an amazing professor just, and he was the one, I will tell you a little side note, uh, when I was trying to make that decision about going to Kimley Horn. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Parsons. Um, I went to him and he said, if Kimley Horn makes you an offer, take it. So I had that little birdie here. I was, I was going to take it even with my dad's maybe not blessing. But um, so what he did as part of one of his classes when I was getting my master's, he actually showed his slide for, it seemed like forever, but it was probably a 30 minutes and he would actually go to accidents to do like accident reconstruction, whatever, and just showed all these pictures of accidents that were just pretty mind, you know, numbing, heart wrenching, everything. And, it, and, and his simple thing was, you know, talking about safety, but talking about things like just, you know, putting your, you know, your seatbelt on, those kind of things. So it's, it's, again, for me, head and shoulders, it's, focusing on safety and whatever we could do because you know being a dad of five and one of my you know one of my best friends in Georgia is um, neighbor right across the street they they lost their 17 year old daughter who was hit you know by a car as a pedestrian and you know your life is forever changed so I think safety safety safety
Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, uh, so thank you for your presentation and interaction with us. And okay. I have a pretty practical question for you. So for a current bo booming AR technology, so what do you think are the prospects that can be applied in the transportation research, especially in the street level or pedestrian level and that work, something like that? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I, you know, I, you know, in the last you know couple of years when you started to hear about AI and the like and and of course all I thought was you know and I'll jokingly say this was like you know people getting on like hey write my paper for me that kind of thing you know so I was a little probably more skeptical than I should have been because I know there are some wonderful applications out there uh, and I think again I don't really deal a lot with that but I know that that type of you know, technology that can come up with things. And I mean, just e even the thing like, you know, I've, I've seen things with uh, AI, you know, robotics. I mean, if you can have some type of, can you imagine just at, at, at intersections where, you know, and I'm, again, I am not perfect at all. And I, I will never lie and say, I've never used one of these in a car, but I will say this is that, you know, you would love to think that if we can have like some type of, AI robotics like camera that's at intersections that literally will like like be able to like 360 and look into cars and see that phones are in people's hands so they're probably not paying attention and I mean do something bless you I have no idea but I, I just can't believe if I think of that in the last 10 seconds that people can't think of research at intersections where people aren't paying attention to me is the the biggest thing that we're coming up with. So I can't imagine again that that we're getting more distracted and you're getting more and more technology. It is the two most, you know, you know, important things. So from a practical level, we're not going to stop being distracted, unfortunately. I mean, kids now are growing up on those things. I mean, it's almost attached to them. And by the same token, if we've got technology that can, you know, know that you're running a red light, you know, that's about what we think about when we think of technology, but we can do so much better of that. I mean, the cars nowadays, obviously, you know, they don't, you know, lane deviations, you know, they start to push you back. They start, you know, they yell at you when you're doing things. So if we can now put these at intersections and, and, and within cars, so whatever that can be, that's the kind of things that, I mean, we should focus on for the next five, 10, 20, 50 years. So, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned maybe have some camera at the intersection, and I think m most, I will not say most time, but at some intersections we do have those cameras. But if we can detect somebody is distracted, either pedestrian, you know, looking at their phones while crossing the street, or the drivers in the car texting something, but then how are we going to do that? I mean. Uh, do we want to send some warning messages to those, or do we change, for example, the signal timing, or is what what I'm just curious, uh, what could be potential solutions? Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll just put it this. I'll put it this way: as I saw, there was something last night. My my youngest daughter, myself, and my wife were watching uh, like 911 on TV. You know, just we we love the first responders and watching all the things that happen. And there was something like, and it was like one of these alarms that, and I literally jumped, you know, my daughter's like, what's up? And I'm like, I don't know. I was intense. I was watching. So I'm just thinking things like that. If all of a sudden, you know, this camera watches this person that all of a sudden is maybe on their phone or maybe they're just doing something and their heads down and they start to enter an intersection, you know, and I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll get your head up if somebody is like beeping a horn, but if there's no car there or if the car is distracted or it's just zooming and not seeing that person, so things like that. I think you just, it's obviously just making people aware. So, you know, that's where academia comes in and you can spend and do some research and focus on that. And like you said, we've got cameras all over the place. So yes, we can do that. There's there's no doubt. Yes, some some cases they do have the warning, like, uh, you know, for the truck drivers, they actually have camera there. And to watch the driver, if the driver is tied and, you know, if he's not, the driver is not doing something normally, yeah. and then they will send out the warning. So, I like but I guess at the intersection level, yeah, um, for the automated vehicle, you know, they can detect if there's a pedestrian cross, right, so they right. can send the warning to the drivers. 
um, but holistically, you know, how we can improve the intersection safety, maybe we need to come up with some innovative ideas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, any other questions from audience? No? Are you interested in working for Kim Lee Hong after you graduate? <laughs> <laughs> Better ask your questions. <laughs> well, I'll, and I can be here for a few minutes afterwards, so. Mm -hmm. To answer okay. any questions, but I appreciate it. All right, it. great. I think it's perfect time. It's almost one o'clock. So I want to thank you again for being with us. It's uh, a little bit different from other presentations while we hear 40, 45 minutes of the slides. But I think yeah. it's very interactive and, yeah. you know, audience get, get opportunities to ask lots of questions. So thank you for being here with us. Thank you for yeah. the opportunity. Thank you. All right, thank all the audience, either in the classroom or online, for joining us today. So um, we will see you next next week, next Friday. Okay, 